Hello again and welcome. This will be my final video where I attempt to build the fastest breadboard oscillator on the mud ball. If you're not aware, this was a contest started on the EEV blog by a member named Breaking Ohm's Law. It's just for fun and bragging rights. In their words, the aim was to achieve the highest frequency on the EEV blog forum. The current record holder may call himself the incumbent master oscillator for the time the record is held. The rules, no ICs, no crystals, mems, etc. No soldering except to add wire to SMT parts. All electrical connections between individual parts must be made by the breadboard contacts. The output signal shall be signish and be able to drive a 10K load at least 5 volts peak to peak. Update, you may deviate from this rule within reason as we have arrived at microwaves. Self-made discrete parts are allowed and encouraged. No cheating. Drilling a hole through your workbench to connect your tracking generator to the underside of the breadboard will be frowned upon. Post an image of your breadboard and counter or scope, and a brief info on the type of oscillator used. Then he gives bonus points for nerd value, old, strange, obsolete, abused haywire parts, exact frequencies, etc. He says, of course, it's allowed to use common frequency doubling techniques, i.e. distorting, leaching harmonics. Knock yourself out. So far I've been able to maintain a lead, but we've started seeing a lot more participants. One member's already achieved 4.7 GHz, and I'm expecting somebody to surpass my efforts fairly soon. A friend of mine who used to work for Motorola as an RF engineer watched my first video where I showed that 6 GHz oscillator, so he decided he wanted to get in on the competition with a 20 GHz oscillator. So over the last few weeks I've been asking him to see this oscillator. So the other day this package shows up. Fragile 20 gigahertz VCO. You can see it's in a nice anastatic bag. Can you see it? So it's got me thinking about turning my friend's imaginary oscillator into a reality. Basically trying to build a 20 gigahertz oscillator on a piece of breadboard. This competition is just for fun, so I may as well aim for some really high numbers. What's the worst that could happen? Of course, setting high goals like these for yourself doesn't mean that you always reach them. First, I need to think about how I'm going to measure a 20 gigahertz oscillator with the equipment that I already own. This is an amplifier that I picked up at the Dayton Ham Fest several years ago in a scrap bin for a couple of bucks. I bought it for the case and the connectors and ended up making a comb generator out of it. Comb generator basically causes harmonics. If you look at it with a spectrum analyzer, it'll resemble an upside down comb, which is where it gets its name from. So I own an HP 5342A microwave counter that I've been using for these experiments. It's only rated for 18 gigahertz. I ran a test using this comb generator and a high pass filter and I was able to read over 21 gigahertz with that counter. At about 21.5 it started to fold back or in other words basically it started counting down so I was increasing the frequency. The displayed frequency of the counter was actually decreasing. All the manuals that I have for that counter don't define the upper limit, so I ended up pulling the counter apart to see if any options were installed. There was this option 5 that extended the frequency all the way up to 24 gigahertz. Part of the upgrade required a new sampler. The new part number would have been a 5088-7052. You can see mine has the stock 5088-7022. But because I saw that my counter could already read over 20 gigahertz, I became committed to the project and I'm far too stubborn to care if I fail or not. So looking at this zoomed in photo of the wiring, you can see on the far right it says return and beneath that it says B+. So if we start at the B plus pin, that's one piece of wire and it wraps around this piece of wire that is the return path. That's forming a capacitor and then the wire makes its way and forms into a coil. And the reason for that inductor is to block the AC off of the RF generator. And then in the upper left, you can see that's a piece of coax wire. That's actually the output of the oscillator. And you can see how the same piece of magnet wire makes several turns around the inner conductor of that coax. Then it works its way down to the transistor's collector. So that's one solid piece of wire. So you can see it's a surface mount part. And you can see instead of plugging it directly into the breadboard, it's basically made up three different components before it gets plugged into the breadboard. In the lower left, there's a very fine piece of wire, and it's labeled trimmer. And that piece of wire, or a little stub, it doesn't physically make contact to the wire to the left of it. It's literally just hanging out there in air. And I'm using that piece of wire to trim the oscillator's resonant frequency. 
I want to be clear that I'm not actually designing this oscillator. It would have taken me far more time trying to model it and take a scientific approach than just taking a guess at it. So this is all a result of just trial and error. To be honest, I'm not even sure how I'd go about modeling it. While it may look to the untrained eye that it's a very simple circuit, because of the parasitics it's actually quite complex. So I was able to get this oscillator to run all the way up to 13.5 gigahertz. So I posted the results and it took the new record. So to be clear, this circuit is nothing more than a single transistor and some wire. So for this next oscillator, I ended up starting over from scratch, basically building on the techniques that I had previously used. One of the things that I changed is I introduced some Kapton tape. And if you look at this close up, the tape is around the center conductor of the coax and it's also formed around our return wire. It's just an extra layer of insulation in case the magnet wires enamel breaks down. What I don't want to have happen is to either short out the supply or I don't want to have DC being passed on to my test equipment. So I mentioned that very fine piece of wire that I'm using to trim the oscillator. I was trying to figure out a better way to maybe manipulate that wire while I was actually running the oscillator. So what you can see here is I've got a little dowel pin with a notch cut into it. There's a couple of set screws and a spring. And so that wooden dowel basically acts as a shuttle between these two plastic spacers that get plugged into the breadboard. And you can see how this all fits together. So the metal set screw on the left doesn't actually get turned. The adjustments with the plastic one on the right. And that's pushing that dowel pin against the spring. So as you're adjusting that plastic set screw on the right, you're moving that dowel pin to the left and right. And that's manipulating that wire. Sadly, after I built this whole thing up, it was far too flimsy to actually use it. So I asked for a ruling about using a mechanical XYZ stage to manipulate that wire. And it would be bolted to the same plate that the breadboard's bolted to. Basically what I'm looking for is a very rigid structure. So they ended up approving that concept. So one of the things that they had mentioned and I was also concerned about is you have this piece of metal sitting right next to the oscillator. And it's not so much that the metal's there, but you're trying to adjust it with your fingers. Early on, it was mentioned that we could use the shield. So I decided, really, that's what we're going to have to do here. I'm not too concerned about the parasitics of the shield affecting the oscillator. What I'm hoping is that the shield makes the circuit less sensitive to outside parasitics. Outside parasitics like the adjuster, for example. You can see this shield is a little complex. It has a lip that kind of surrounds the circuit. And then it's basically a square box and you can see I have a slot formed into the bottom of it that wraps around the coax. And here you can see the shield installed on the breadboard. Another change that I've made is you can see on the far left there's a small battery pack and that battery pack holds three AA batteries. In all my previous photos and videos that I've made I've shown these power supply leads coming up to the table and then clipping onto the board and we have a dog and a cat and those wires are dangling down below the circuit board and I'm always concerned that one of them is going to come in and hit it with their tail or something. So I thought I'd just nip that in the bud, run the thing off a small battery pack. This thing draws, you know, like 10 milliamps or something right now. Again, the goal isn't to try to make a lot of power. The goal here is to try to make a sine wave and make it as fast as possible. So here you can see the whole oscillator assembled and it's running at 16 and a half gigahertz. So I submitted this design that got accepted and this oscillator holds the current record. This is looking at a small chip of ferrite underneath the microscope. And I've been playing with this off and on. I was actually able to gain some performance depending where I installed this. So once again, I asked for a ruling, could we use a piece of ferrite chip like this? And they agreed to allow me to use it. So I felt I had enough information to get me started building this next oscillator. So this is looking at the new oscillator assembled. I've got the cover pulled off right now just to take the photograph. There's a large square piece of capped on tape. I ended up running the wires underneath the shield for the power and the return path. And I ran those up to the bus bars so the battery pack could actually plug into the bus bars. And those wires have no insulation on them. So that capped on just provides that insulation barrier from essentially shorting the power supply up to the shield. In this photograph, you're actually looking at the whole oscillator. On the left, you can see this small hair-like wire. Again, that's our trimmer stub. On the right, you can see a small piece of magnet wire soldered to one of the leads of the transistor. And above those two, you can see what looks like a piece of white blob with another short piece of wire attached to it. And that's really what that is, is it's just a very small piece of wire and it's been epoxied to the end of a plastic shaft that goes back to the stage. 
and then what I'm doing is I'm manipulating the position of that piece of wire relative to the other two wires. The black is the transistor and the green that's on the transistor is paint and the reason I did that is the transistor isn't marked as far as the emitter base collector so the green was marking the base of the transistor. It looks like a mess but the transistor again is quite small. That wire that's feeding up to the base that's probably about the size of a whisker off of my beard. So in the second video I made, I talked a little bit about down conversion. And the whole purpose of that was to take these higher frequencies that we're now working with and converting those to a lower frequency signal that I could then display on my oscilloscope and my spectrum analyzer. So this down converter used an old Avantech YIG. It was capable of reaching frequencies a little over 8 gigahertz. The mixer that I was using for mini circuits has a maximum IF frequency of 4 gigahertz. So that gave us an upper end of 8 gigahertz plus the 4 gigahertz IF or around 12 gigahertz. So early on I took the 13.5 gigahertz oscillator. I attached it directly to my LaCroix 8500A. Again that scope has an upper bandwidth of 5 gigahertz. There's nothing that suggests that the oscillator is actually running. Apparently 13.5 GHz is just too fast for the 5 GHz DSO. Now my signal hound can display up to 6 GHz and of course it's a lot more sensitive than the oscilloscope. So I set the YIG for 8 GHz. So if we take the 13.5 GHz of our oscillator minus the 8 GHz of the local oscillator we're expecting to see something around 5.5 GHz. So what I end up doing is I bypass that down converter splitter that's right on the front end. I want to gain back that 6 dB that we lost with it. And here you can see it shows right up at minus 70 dB. One of the things to keep in mind while you're looking at this, minus 70 dB is a pretty low signal, but the actual signal coming out of the oscillator is going to be a lot higher. Again, we're running this way outside of the mixer's IF frequency. So originally when I put that down converter together, I wasn't expecting to run much over 10 gigahertz with that. To be able to view signals above 12 GHz with the Signal Hound and LaCroix, I need to construct a new down converter. Unfortunately, every component that's used for the original down converter can't be salvaged for this new one. So here you can see three new components from many circuits. It consists of a new mixer, there's a new 8 GHz amplifier, that's for the IF, and there's also a 6 GHz low pass filter for the image rejection. Here you can see the two down converters, the new one being on the left. You can see it's quite a bit smaller. This down converter uses a 12 gigahertz dielectric resonant oscillator, or as they're commonly called in the industry, a DRO. This one's made by CTI and requires a 100 megahertz signal for a reference. That'll be derived from my RF generator, which is referenced to my GPS. These DROs have a very, very low phase noise once they're locked. The fastest DROs that I've seen used are 14.6 gigahertz. So this is a spreadsheet for the new down converter. It's a little complex, but there's two different down converters being shown. The one on the left is using a 14.6 gigahertz DRO. The one on the right is what I built, and that's using a 12 gigahertz DRO. In the second column, we're showing the RF frequency, and this would be the frequency of our oscillator that we're testing. So you can see I'm sweeping it from 10 gigahertz up to 22 gigahertz. In the next column, we're looking at the IF frequency. And this is the difference between the 14.6 and whatever the RF frequency is. Notice as our RF frequency approaches 14.6 GHz, the IF frequency is decreasing. Once we get beyond the 14.6, then the frequency starts to increase again. Again, we're looking at the difference between the two signals. In the next column, I have something called a second IF. And essentially this works like any broadcast receiver. So for example, a 22 gigahertz RF frequency, that's going to give us a first IF of 7.4 gigahertz. Now again, our signal hound is only good for 6 gigahertz. And so what we do is we run that through a second mixer and we mix it down to 6 gigahertz. And the other nice thing about this is that first low frequency doesn't have to be an even number. Again, you can see we're at 14.6. And then the second IF stage, we're using 1.4, and that works out to an even number. So we're basically doing this math in hardware. So what I've built is the down converter on the right. And again, we're using a 12 gigahertz DRO in this case. At 11 gigahertz, it's going to be 12 minus 11, or 1. And at 12 gigahertz RF, it's going to give us an IF of 0 hertz. And then you can see again, once we get beyond 12 gigahertz, as the RF frequency continues to climb, so does the IF frequency. So again, our LaCroix scope is rated for 5 gigahertz. So even just using a single stage converter will allow us to display signals all the way up to 17 gigahertz. 
If we wanted to go even faster, we could pump this through a second stage mixer, mix it in with 2 GHz for example, and that 17 GHz is now going to be 3 GHz, 19 GHz would give us 5 GHz, that'd be the upper limit of the scope. So the limitation of this is again, whatever the mixer's IF frequency, in this case that 20 GHz mixer from mini circuits, again it's rated for 20 GHz on the RF, and it has an IF maximum frequency of 7 GHz. So that 19 GHz is essentially the upper limit. So what I was thinking is basically we're going to gain 2 GHz by adding a whole nother mixer. It's probably not worth it just for this demonstration. So I put this simple block diagram together just in case you're not understanding how this is all wired. So we have the RF input from our test oscillator that goes into this circle with an X. It's a multiplier or a mixer. And that mixer has a low input, which is fed from our fixed oscillator, in this case a DRO or a YIG. The output of that goes through an image rejection filter or a low pass filter. And then it goes through some kind of amplifier. So if we wanted to do a double conversion, we just replicate that circuit and put it in series. This is our new down converter. And the reference is tied to our RF generator, which is again referenced to the GPS receiver. And our output cable goes directly into the frequency counter. And again, this is a 12 gigahertz DRO. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and turn on the power supply. And you can see how this thing kind of moves around a little bit. And that's because I don't have a reference applied right now. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and I'll turn that up. And you'll see right when this thing locks right here. Again, this frequency counter is also tied to the GPS receiver, and that's why this is able to read out to 1 hertz. This is our previous generation of the oscillator, and you can see its output is attached directly to my microwave frequency counter. Let me just go ahead and we'll turn it on. And you can see it's running at basically 10.928 gigahertz. So now what we're going to do is we'll take the output of our oscillator and we're going to attach that to the input of our down converter. Again this has a local oscillator of 12 gigahertz. And we'll tie the output of the down converter to the input of the counter. Again the way this is constructed, again this is the output of the DRO. And you can see this runs to a 21.5 gigahertz attenuator and that feeds the local oscillator of the mixer. Our test oscillator runs into the RF input. The intermediate frequency, or IF, goes through a small image rejection filter. And then this runs into another amplifier. And then this goes back to the frequency counter input. Let's go ahead and we'll turn on our oscillator again. So again, it was running at 10.928 originally. So if we take 12.0 minus 10.928, and see that's 1.072 gigahertz. It's possible we may have bumped something. Let's just see. Oh, sure enough. See how it's changed that little bit? 10.932 and 10.061. So I think it's just drifting around a little bit. Again, with the DRO and this frequency counter both being referenced back to the GPS receiver, these aren't drifting at all. All the drift is basically coming out of our oscillator here. So you can see our microwave counter is directly attached to our new oscillator now. And you can see it's outputting roughly 15.34 gigahertz. We'll connect its output to our down converter. And essentially it's going to be 15.34 minus 12.0. You can see it's 3.341, and again, this frequency counter is more than capable of reading the 15 gigahertz that this oscillator is currently putting out. The idea of this is if we wanted to see what this waveform looks like, we can now attach the output of this down converter to our oscilloscope. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so I've had our oscilloscope warming up for a little bit. Let's just go ahead and we'll move our output of our down converter. Back to the oscilloscope's input. Right, you can see it's at uh, 3.3 something gigahertz. Let's go ahead and we'll turn on measurement 
and we'll turn statistics on and we can see right here it's 3.342 gigahertz let's go ahead and we'll change the sampling over to risk mode you can see our noise it's got a nice Gaussian peak to it for fun let's just go ahead and we'll hook up our other oscillator again this is our previous generation oscillator so you have the output attached to our down converter and its output again attached to our LaCroix scope and you can see it's running at roughly 1.06 gigahertz now this is in real-time mode you can see it's sampling at 20 giga samples per second right now that shows up on the camera let's go ahead and we'll change this over to wrist you can see this oscillator is a little more noisy of course it doesn't have the shield over it right now either again we said with this current configuration of the down converter we could look at signals all the way up to 17 gigahertz so I've retuned our new oscillator for close to 17 gigahertz as a matter of fact this would be a new record right here you can see it's 16.8 and you can see like I'm just bringing the connector close to it you can see it looks very clean you can see the scope is currently set for wrist mode it's at 200 giga samples per second and you can see our frequency is roughly 4.8 gigahertz again we're going to add that to 12 and that's going to give us the 16.8 that we were seeing with our frequency counter let me just go ahead and we'll enable persistence can see it's just very clean that shield helps a lot of course I'm planning that the oscillator is actually going to run a much faster than what this down converter will work to what I wanted to demonstrate is essentially that the output is indeed a sine wave and it's quite low distortion and for these next set of tests I'm assuming that it's going to have basically the same wave shape because all I'll be doing is tuning that stub adjustment so before I made any adjustments, I'd just go ahead and hook this up to the signal hound. Again, we can see the peak is right at 4.81 gigahertz. This is running in real-time mode. Let me just change it to sweep mode. That's a good thing that they don't care about the phase noise. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot else I can do anyway as far as displaying these waveforms. We're just going to have to assume as I adjust the frequency up on this oscillator that it's going to maintain roughly the same shape.
I'm a little concerned that this piece of coax is just causing too much attenuation at these higher frequencies. So you can see I've replaced this with a section of semi-rigid. I'm going to say that that's plenty fast to beat my friend's 20 gigahertz VCO. I'm pretty sure this is going to be the end of my breadboard oscillator building. So I hope you enjoyed the series. I hope you're all staying safe. Till the next video. Later.